Looking to protect your cards? Whether you need sleeves, deck boxes, binders, playmats, or even backpacks, Ultimate Guard has your collection covered. Literally. Premium products offering priceless protection. Visit ultimateguard.com. Hello and welcome to another Historic Brawl game. Today we're taking a look at a Black Green Shelob a Child of Angoliant deck as voted on by my supporters on Patreon. This 6 mana Legendary Spider Demon is an 8-8 with Death Touch and Ward 2 and says other spiders we control also have Death Touch and Ward 2. And then whenever another creature dealt damage if this turn by a spider we control to dies, create a token that's a copy of that creature, except it's a food artifact that can be sacrificed for 3 life, and it also loses all other card types. So while that token won't be able to attack and block, it will still potentially trigger any enter the battlefield abilities that the creature had, and other static abilities could also come in handy. And then we're not really a spider tribal deck, as you can see only a handful of other spiders to synergize with Shelob, but I am playing quite a few fight effects, which are a great way of enabling Shelob's last ability, otherwise we need to rely on the opponent chum blocking our spiders to turn their creatures into food tokens, so with a fight spell that's much easier to accomplish. And then the other spiders in our deck include Black Market Connections, doesn't look like a spider at first glance, it's a nice card draw engine that can also make extra treasure tokens each turn at the cost of some life, but can also make shapeshifter tokens that are changelings, so they have all creature types including spider. There's Arasta, making 1-2 spider tokens with reach whenever the opponent casts an instant or sorcery spell. There's Spider Queen, making a pair of 2-1 spider tokens with menace and reach, can also draw extra cards, and gains extra loyalty when our creatures die. And then Ishkana can also make a batch of 1-2 spider tokens with reach if we have Delirium enabled, and our deck has a pretty wide range of card types, including the new battle type, which can also enable Ishkana. And then our fight spells include a Blizzard Brawl, that's the main reason why we have all these snow-covered basics in our deck. Bushwhack can also find a basic land instead. Tail Swipe and Instant Speed, fight spell for one mana, can also potentially give plus one plus one. Then we've got some Bite effects, which will also work quite well with Shelob, and whenever we use a Fight effect or Bite effect with a Death Touch creature, it doesn't matter how large the opponent's creature is, we'll always be able to take it out. And then a Bite Down can also potentially target Planeswalkers, similar to Cosmic Hunger, which also goes after battles. There's Master's Rebuke. And then Animus Might is a recent addition, can be cast for a single green if it targets our legendary creature, so it can also be a very efficient removal spell. And then Vorinclex I put in the fight spell category, because if we transform it, it can eventually help our creatures fight, but it is also just a great card in and of itself, finding extra force when it enters, and then if we ever transform it, it's usually game over. And then a Primal Might can also be a nice mana sink. And then the Spinning Wheel Kick is the most exciting one, since this can fight multiple creatures at once, so that can also be very effective alongside a Shelob. Then the next category is Mana Acceleration, since we do need to get to 6 for Shelob and some of our other expensive spells. So there's Dark Ritual, which can set up some explosive openings. There's a few mana creatures at 1 mana, with a Halfling, Elvish Mystic, and Talanor Elves. Then at 2 mana we've got Explorer, into the north to find a snow-covered land, and then a Wolf Willow Haven, enchanting a land, letting it produce extra green. We've got some ramp artifacts with Signet, Cold Steel Heart, Guardian Idol, and Mindstone. Cultivated 3 is another great one. Harrow can sack a land, find two lands that entered battlefield untapped, so we can use them right away. And then as a new invasion of Zendikar, a battle that can also find two lands, potentially transform into the Skyclave. And then Anissa, another great way to accelerate our mana by doubling the amount of mana produced by our forests and untapping a land each turn. And then we've got a ton more interaction here, mainly spot removal to complement our fight spells, starting with cut down at one mana. There's Thought Seize for hand disruption. Feed the Swarm can hit creatures as well as enchantments. Go for the Throat and Heartless Act instant speed removal. We've got Shielders Edict, which can also potentially hit Planeswalkers. Terra Sunder, also great when dealing with artifacts or enchantments, also exiles the creature which can be relevant. There's Elspeth's Nightmare, another one of my favorites, and all three modes can be very useful. We've got Murderous Rider, another instant speed removal spell, can also hit Planeswalkers and gives us a 2-3 creature afterwards. Maelstrom Pulse is also quite flexible, and despite playing it in a singleton format, it can potentially deal with multiple of the same token. There's Binding the Old Gods, which can also help us ramp after taking something out. Vraska can also sacrifice some of our tokens or other lands we don't need in the late game and draw extra cards while potentially taking something out when we play it. There's Death Sprouts, similar to Binding, it takes something out and helps us ramp. Gix's Command as one of our sweepers, can also potentially get stuff back from our graveyard. Blood on the Snow, another payoff for having all these snow-covered lands, can destroy all creatures or potentially all planeswalkers and then get something back from the graveyard. 
Kongolan is also great, finding something when it enters, can also destroy artifacts or enchantments when it attacks. Vraska can make 2-2 pirate tokens with menace or deal with various card types. And then there's Casualties of War, which is also very effective in this format, can often deal with multiple card types at once. And then we've got more sources of card advantage here, starting with Phyrexian Arena, drawing an extra card at the cost of one life each turn. Fight Rigging can hide away a card, and then with our Shield Up we can enable it right away. There's Augur of Autumn, playing lands over the top and eventually creatures as well. Glissa can also draw extra cards if it hits the opponent or maybe take out an enchantment. There's the Oracle of Moldaya to play lands over the top. We've got Acolyte of Affliction, getting something back from the graveyard when it enters. Return of the Wild Speaker is excellent with our 8-8 Shelob, drawing 8 cards. We've got Rishkar's Expertise, also drawing 8 and then casting a 5-drop for free potentially. There's a Last March of the Ends, another recent addition here, also draws 8, and then we can put a bunch of creatures into play for free. And the Great Hench we can cast for double green with Shilob out. Even though we don't have a ton of creatures in the deck, it's still an excellent way to keep developing our mana. And then we've got some additional cards here with Shieldred, also very nice with all these card draw effects as we can gain 2 life for each card we draw. And then a Titan of Industry, another all-purpose card that can help protect Shilob, maybe take out some artifact or enchantment, and can also gain some more life back. And then a mana base has a few utility lands, including Castle Lochthwain, which can also draw additional cards. The channel lands are always an easy inclusion. And then Castle Garenbrick, especially handy when we need to pay the commander tax for Shelob. This will potentially add an extra mana for us. And then a plenty of black-green dual lands for mana fixing. So yeah, that's our deck. Now let's jump into some games and see how the deck does. Okay, we're on the play, facing Nissa, Resurgent Animist. Our hand seems quite decent. Couple ways to ramp. And then the Great Henge, gonna be a nice follow up to Shilob. Potent reverses for a basic. And then let's just explore for now. Next turn we could play Haven and still feed the swarm. Okay, so next turn we're ready to cast our commander. Opponent with a Saddle of the Wilds, so no target for Feed the Swarm just yet. And I don't expect Mono Green to be able to remove our 8 8 with Ward 2 all that easily. There's Nissa. And then being able to potentially gain a Nissa. Food token, if we find a fight spell, could also be quite nice, since we'll still get the landfall triggers. For now, hoping to potentially find another creature to combine with the Great Henge. Go for the Throat instead. Okay, so we'll play Henge, it pays for itself. And then probably feed the Swarm Nissa. Hang on to go for the Throat for a future creature. And then we can hit for 8. And then if they replay Nissa, we can answer it right away. Another option was sacking the Haven to make a token, although that doesn't draw with a Henge. Opponent played land, so there's Nissa again. Interesting that they played land beforehand to not get the landfall trigger. Visionary, that's fine. So I'll take out Nissa once again. And then make sure to gain two with Henge. And hope to find something exciting off the top. Oracle certainly counts. Draw Binding. Play a land. Play another land. And connections coming up. So I'll take out Visionary. Hit for 8 again. And our opponent needs a pretty powerful turn here. But they've got a decent amount of mana. And there's Nissa. Into another fetch lane, so that's 2 more mana. And of course they get to find an elf or elemental as well. And they found an oracle. Okay. No use for the two mana. 
binding triggers and we could find an overgrown tomb here if we'd like. Idle on top, not the best card. So don't get to have a super exciting turn here, but still get to play connections. Probably time to cash in Haven for a wolf and I'm okay trading Oracle for Nyssa. So the trade happens, opponent is forced to, and then we'll make a wolf, which is now also lethal. Okay. Provisioner is a good one. Can make treasures or food tokens with landfall. Their own oracle, play land over the top, trigger provisioner. So now they still have five mana for a solemn, which can also find a land and trigger provisioner. So now they've got quite a few chum blockers to block Shilob and the wolf. So hopefully this connection can find us some more goodies. So we're definitely choosing all three modes. Okay, did not find all that much. So just gonna attack here. At least we forced them to trade off Oracle. And then Guardian Idol represents another two-powered creature. Opponent forced to block Shield up does give us a solemn food token, so that can search up a land. And then if we sacrifice it, I think it still draws. Okay, Elf can draw with Henge. And just a land. Okay. So now we have three more lethal threats. Other opponent can just make food token with Provisioner, as opposed to keep making treasure. They got one from the Gingerbread Cabin now. That is a Ascended Animist with nine forests in play, so... We have to be careful that we don't just die to it. Nissa who shakes the world? Yeah, that's another great combo. So, opponent can now pretty much empty their hand. And uh, yeah, they could have lots of scary cards there. Untapped cabin. Are we dead to a Nissa ultimate here? Three creatures. And nine forests. Ooh, awaken the woods for 18. Yeah, and then now 18 provisioner triggers making treasure and then play Ascended Animist now with over 26 forests in play. So the two creatures should be lethal by themselves. Yeah, opponent managed to come back here after being on the brink of death for a few turns. We just kind of missed on applying a bit of extra pressure when we had the henge. Couldn't quite string together enough creatures. But impressive comeback. Still nice that we got to get a little bit of value of Shilob in the end with the Solemn at least. Ashaya first. Don't think that's really going to make all that much of a difference. They can just play their uh, Ascended Animist for the win. And they actually tapped two creatures, so... Huh. Yeah, that's strange. I think our opponent had lethal, had they just gone for Animist right away. But now their two attackers are tapped. Sack of food token. I mean, we're probably still not going to win here, but... I feel like our opponent might have uh, made a few errors. Could still maybe top deck a sweeper. Sometimes when you're very far behind on board the entire game, then you get in the mindset that you gotta avoid losing, but you don't necessarily see the winning line that can just end the game on the spot. So tunnel vision can definitely happen. Alright, let's go for all three modes. Since we're probably not getting another turn. A last march of the ends, you say. Okay, that's not a bad one. Got an 8 toughness creature. And what do we get? One spider and a bunch of removal. 
No discard spell for Nyssa. That's kind of what we needed. Did not find our Thoughtseize. And uh, Abandoned Mire also doesn't have much to get back besides Oracle. So we're still probably dead to the Animist next turn. Yeah, we can kill quite a few things. I guess Cosmic Hunger lets us deal with Ashaya and essentially make a food version of it. Could also kill Nissa, who shakes the world. Can also damage Planeswalkers. Is there any way that there's going to be a trigger when Nissa enters? So we can maybe kill it in response to it being able to use a minus seven? I doubt it. Yeah, even with Fabled Passage, it's not like I can put a trigger on the stack in response. So I'm not really seeing a way out here. Probably start with an Animus Smite anyway. And because of Death Touch, a Shia down. And then we can Cosmic Hunger, Nissa. Could also, I guess, get rid of the Provisioner here. But it's not like I'm going to be able to draw with it. Okay. Well, let's attack all out and see what happens. Is their opponent about to take five, but they can just sack some food here to stay alive? A grazer, which can put a land in play. And uh, yeah, that's still kind of it for now. Soul of the Harvest, that happens. And this, our Surgeant Animist. Is Rippo not going for lethal with uh, Big Nissa here? There she is. So our opponent did not play Nissa for the full amount. So we actually still have a chance here. Strangely enough. So Soul of the Harvest says one of our non-token enters. So we can just tear asunder the Nissa here. And then we'll have Heartless Act for Soul of the Harvest. You can't Our Opponent does have a lot of food. So yeah, once again, feels like we should have been dead. But I'll take it. Connections, now I'm just gonna draw a card. It is nice that the shapeshifters are also spiders for uh, shilip purposes. Can uh, potentially abandon Meyer back our Oracle of Moldaya. Ooh, that uh, Gix's Commander would have been nice. Land we'll just draw with Hinge. And then a Blizzard Brawl we can draw into with Mindstone. And then we can essentially steal Soul of the Harvest here by fighting with one of our spiders. We could also get rid of Nissa since we haven't played a land for the turn yet, so then we'll be able to trigger Nissa right away. Yeah, maybe that's actually better here. Opponents empty handed, so they may not get value from Soul right away. And we can still take it out with a Heartless Act. It's 
So we get our Nissan token. Nissan triggers. We find an Alpha Elemental. Not even sure if we have any left in the deck. Elvish Mystic. So land on top, we'll draw into here. And then all our creatures are also lands because of Ashaya, so they also trigger Nissa, making an extra mana. And there's a Vorinclex on top. Well, that's going to be an excellent uh, play next turn. No way of drawing into it right now. But let's Heartless Act, Soul of the Harvest. And then attack with our spiders. Maybe could have afforded to make another shapeshifter since we can just sack a grazer to gain some life here. So yeah, we're getting to synergize with the opponent's cards. That's kind of neat. opponent cashes in all their food so they can take a bit of a hit still trading for one of their tokens which will turn into a food token since we have a shapeshifter that's a spider pass it back okay opponent's got 16 one ones and now a portal to Phyrexia. Wow, that was a good top deck. Okay, so let's animate Guardian Idol in response. And then Psych Idol, Elvish Mystic, and probably just a Shapeshifter. There's Nissa. And I'll cash in Grazer and the Horror Token. Okay. So Vorinclex is coming up. And, ooh, that's a nice one. So let's definitely draw that. And I'll go ahead and make another Shapeshifter. And this may be close to the last turn of the game, so might as well make an extra treasure. Because a spinning wheel kick can take care of lots of creatures at once. Return of the Wild Speaker is a good one too. Can draw into it once we play Vorinclex. But uh, let's wheel kick. X equals, let's say, one, two, three, four. Could do it for more, but I also want to still play Vorinclex. So those all turn into food tokens. I guess this is legendary, so I might have wanted to sacrifice it first. Could still do it here, although I might have better uses for my mana. Play Vorinclex. Lots of triggers happening. It is a land because of the uh, Ashaya, so it also triggers the Provisioner food token which can make a treasure. I meant to reorder my triggers so we could draw with Henge before searching with Vorinclex, so now I shuffled away the uh, Return of the Wild Speaker, but that's all right. Can play land off the top with Oracle. That also triggers our Nissa food token. And find an elemental, and that can blow up Portal to Phyrexia. Thoughtseize on top, not gonna have any targets, and our opponent explodes. Wow, this was a crazy game. Our opponent was actually in a position to kill us several times, but uh, yeah, that's why you don't concede. Sometimes they don't see the lethal line, and you can still get there in the end. On to the next one. Okay, we're on the draw, facing a Nathroi Graveyard deck. We've got uh, Helenor Elves, although no untapped green source. Still seems like a keep. 
Turn 4 Spider Queen, turn 5 Shilob could be quite nice. And now we can play turn 1 Elf. Gonna hang on to Bushwhack as a fight spell since we've got plenty of lanes. Okay, Binding could come up next turn already. Incubation Druid's also a good one alongside Nethroy as a zero powered creature. And Butler's gonna mill, finding Scrap Gorger and Stomper. And another Lanor Elves. Okay, so we can take out the opponent's Incubation Druid, perhaps. Close call between Druid and Lanor Elves, but Druid they can potentially put a counter onto, and then it can make even more mana, or they can adapt. Although it is a zero powered creature, so it's easier to get back with Nethroi compared to a Lanor Elves. And then by getting a Forest with Binding, Castle comes into play untapped. Opponent's just going to cast Nethroi as a 5 5. And we can get our dual end. Okay, so play Spider Queen seems fine. Just make some spiders. Alternative of invasion to ramp is also reasonable. Spiders don't have Death Touch yet, but as soon as we play Shelob, these will turn into excellent blockers. Grizzly Salvage to keep milling. Possible they have a different way of mutating to mutate onto Nethroi, as opposed to mutating Nethroi itself. So that's definitely possible. If they've got a cheap mutate here, we could be in trouble. Old Rudstein, that's fine. So we can protect Spider Queen. Opponent passes. Okay, so we should have enough mana now to play Shilob and Bushwhack. <laughs> My hatred lives. If we use Castle, that also makes an extra mana, not that we're gonna spend it here. So if I play Shilob, what are we fighting? If I kill Nethroid, they get it back in the command zone, but then it's gonna be pretty pricey to mutate, so that might be fine. Nethroy does have Death Touch, so the fight is going to result in a trade, so we probably want to fight with our Death Touching Spider token instead. And then we'll get a Nethroy food token. Don't think it does much for us, but yeah, it's nice to have. We'll add it to the collection. And then our Spider probably hangs back to protect Spider Queen. Opponent got a treasure, so that helps in mutating Nethroi a little sooner. And a Phyrexian Tower also makes an extra mana here. So 6, 7, 8, 9. Mutate 7, so yeah, they get there, even with the commander attacks. Spiking those two extra mana sources. And what's your opponent going to get back? Maybe a Titan or a Cavalier. So pretty good here. Opponent didn't sacrifice a creature to Phyrexian Tower, so maybe they've got different plans. This looks like a Casualties of War, which is also going to be pretty effective here. Yeah, and our opponent can pay the ward. Well, that pretty much kills uh, our whole board. Not what we wanted to see. My will cannot be denied. Can... Uh, Play Vraska, kill Rudstein, and still feed the swarm a lateral elves, perhaps. Make it harder for them to mutate. And then we'll hang back to protect Vraska. Ooh, Tyranax Rex. Yeah, that's a good one. 8-8, eight, eight, Toxic 4, Trample Ward, Haste. Well, Death Touch is still potentially a way to beat it. 
Put on good back a Cavalier of Thorns. And goes for Vraska, so I wouldn't be able to save it here. Terra Sunder, so Ward 4 can be paid for. So we could either Terra Sunder with Kicker or we can play Shelob. Could still see the advantage of playing Shelob as we get on the board. And then our Spider could trade for Tyranex, so they may not attack. And then Terra Sunder is a pretty clean answer to Cavalier, so it doesn't get anything back from the graveyard. We'll still take some poison. But we'll get a Tyranax food token as well. Should be extra nutritious. And there's Cavalier. All right. So now we could also consider keeping up Terra Sunder so we can exile the creature in response to them mutating. So they don't get to bring a bunch of stuff back. Because their graveyard is getting quite full. Opponent can still escape a Woe Strider. And that lets them sack Cavalier to be guaranteed a Cavalier trigger. And then what's the best they can get back? There's some good ones here. Getting back casualties would hurt. Just play Invasion. And then... Could attack the Invasion with our Spider here. For opponent double blocks. Then they've got fewer creatures to mutate onto. They're just a chum block and a sacrifice to the Strider. So Shelob also not the best with Strider around since their opponent can always sacrifice their creature instead of letting it die and us getting an extra food token. Okay. Pass it back. Opponent mutates on Cavalier. Well, Exile to response. Opponent will sacrifice and get back something from the graveyard. So I was hoping they would mute it onto the Strider itself, but that was unlikely. At least the Nethroid doesn't happen. They'll just get a 5-5 Death Touch. And our opponent gets back casualties. So that's going to blow up a land on our Shelob. Strider attacks, we'll take it. And a Death Sprout's a good one. So now we can clear Nethroi. Since Strider can just easily escape again. And then I guess our opponent by sacking Nethroi to the Strider, we don't get to search for a basic. So maybe killing Strider is still the play. Let me attack with Shelob. And then maybe I should take out Strider before they get a chance to block and sacrifice. Sure. At least if they keep escaping Strider, there's going to be fewer things they can return with Nethroi. Bone and Dust trade. So we'll get another Nethroi food token. And we'll pass it back. Now ready to gain 6. Now Nethroi is 9 mana to play and even more to mutate. Old stick fingers for 6, okay. That's another way of filling the graveyard here. And they even found a Timeless Witness to get value from the graveyard. And that's a 1717, so that's not messing around. We're in trouble. So we can play Shelob and then probably have to hang back with the Lenor Elves to potentially chump. Could also explore, but let's do that next turn. Now 
our opponent on taps. They could bring back a witness or they could escape voice strider here. And then we have to decide whether to chump stick fingers or trade. What is this? Our opponent mutates Nethroi, sacrificing their stick fingers in the process to what I assume is the Phyrexian Tower, since that was the only way to generate enough mana. And yeah, since you declare what to mutate onto before paying the cost, that's an easy mistake to make, and our opponent shame scoops because of that. Well, we did just top deck a Great Henge, so that was going to be a nice way to potentially take over if we can string together some creatures. But yeah, if our opponent successfully mutated Nethroid, they would have gotten a ton of stuff back from the graveyard, and that's probably going to be too much for us to handle. So yeah, interesting end to this game, but it uh, goes to show that you have to be careful when playing with Phyrexian Tower. Okay, we're on the draw, facing Aragorn. Makes for a good food target, potentially, as we'll potentially gain those abilities to give plus four, plus four. Our hand seems fine, into the north to get our black mana going, and then we've got plenty of answers. Would like to find a fight spell to combine with Shilob. Turn on Pilgrim does potentially set up an early Aragorn, and the indestructible R1 can also protect it now. So that's uh, definitely an issue. So how do we proceed from here? Probably still into the north, and then if they tap out for Aragorn, I can take it out with Binding. But they may wait to protect it instead. Alright, opponent will step out for Aragorn. So now they can't protect it with Arwen anymore. And then next turn we could both Nightmare and feed the Swarm. Opponent explores. And then Esper Sentinel. Followed by Swiftfoot Boots. So plenty of ways to protect Aragorn now. And find another dual land here. Okay, so. Do have a Boseju to blow up the boots, potentially. Put on my draw Sentinel if I go with Elspeth's Nightmare. But then I could also feed the Swarm the Avacyn's Pilgrim to delay our opponent replaying Aragorn. That seems fine. So, Nightmare, and then I'm not going to pay the Sentinel tax. And then feed the Swarm Pilgrim. Vraska can also blow up the boots, so we've got a few answers. Ascendancy, also going to be quite effective. Now Arwen's got the boots. But a Shilob can block it. So, yeah, had they sequenced slightly differently, Arwen could have been a bigger problem. Ooh, a last march is going to be exciting too. Nightmare to take away Supreme Verdict also would have been quite nice with an Indestructible R1 in play. And then I think we play Boseju now, since we need to build up towards 8 mana. Shilob's in play. Would love to turn R1 into a food token. Would make for quite a snack. Tamiyo is a good one. That can keep Shilob tapped down if they pay the ward. And Ascendancy also adding extra loyalty to Tamiyo. Okay, so what's next here? Can play Vraska and then make a pirate. Play Mystic. And then next turn, even if our opponent tamps down our two creatures and attacks Vraska, we'll still have enough loyalty to Minus, make a treasure, and that's going to be enough mana for our last march. Sounds good. The Minus doesn't destroy Planeswalkers, could destroy the Ascendancy, but this way we protect our Vrask a bit better. I'm looking forward to a last march next turn. So hopefully their top deck didn't change it. Polymorphists, that's an alchemy card. 
So goodbye, Shilob. So we'll send it back to the command zone. And our last march is not quite as exciting anymore. Polymorphous gains haste. And our opponent's going to tap down our two creatures to pressure Vraska, so we can't minus it anymore. Okay. Well, Shielder's Edict is an answer to Tamiya, at least. And Vorinclex can help us hit our land drops. So that looks okay. And then we can make a pirate. Making them sack a creature not quite as effective when they can just sack the Polymorphist. Time for Aragorn at long last. They have the one mana up for Arwen's Indestructible. Vorinclex can block Aragorn now that they can't use Arwen anymore. And then I can save Raska by jumping. Seems worth it. Alrighty, so make a pirate. Could also transform Vorinclex, but I kind of want to just replay Shilob and then set up our last march. And then let's take out the Polymorphist while the shields are down for Arwen. And hit for eight. Got two blockers back. Maybe I should keep an extra pyro on defense as a chum blocker. And then it's time for the ends to rise up. Arana's also a pretty good one. And gains haste. Although doesn't really have a great attack into Shilob. They can make it indestructible, I suppose. But now it's time to untap, and no our opponent explodes before we could draw eight cards here. But uh, yeah, we're definitely taking over from here. On to the next one. Okay, we're on the draw with a decent hand. Got both Halfling and Dark Ritual to set up an early invasion, perhaps. Opponent's got their own turn one elf. Playing an early invasion will give us a nice mana advantage early on. Could also set up an early Shieldred, which could be effective. But maybe our plan should be to ramp out Shilob and then return of the Wild Speaker to draw a bunch of cards. And a Mind Stone on two. Feed the Swarm. Does that change anything? Not really. I'll still go for Invasion. And then we can hit our battle for one. With a land, so we get to play Shilob. Opponent's got an Emoti. Hitting a Rejuvenator. Your opponent, without a Dark Ritual, is ramping just as well as we are. Blood on the Snow, that could be an important reset button. So, could play Augur of Autumn, try and hit a land off the top, and then if we miss, we can still feed the Swarm at the very least. Take out Emoti, even though they can replay it already. Lumbering Isle can eventually turn into a 12-12, and a conundrum is going to prevent us from potentially putting extra lanes in play. Okay, a land on top. And then a Rishkar's Expertise coming up here. So, Augur can attack the invasion. This does count as a land, I believe. So I wonder how it's going to interact with the Conundrum. I guess picking up the battle wouldn't be a bad thing, necessarily. 
So let's start by attacking. And then I'm probably just gonna play Shilob. Put on chumps anyway. Could also play Nissa. Let's see, one, two, three, four, five. And then tap Overgrown Tomb, untap it, and still play Shieldred. Yeah, I don't hate it. So we're unlikely to cast blood on the snow anytime soon. But now uh, Rishkar's expertise and a wild speaker could gain us a ton of life with Shieldred out. Emote hits a midnight clock, slumbering isle, slowly turning into a creature here. At least our death touching spiders line up well against it. Okay, so we can cast our Rishkar's Expertise. Or we could play Shilob first, so we can draw even more cards. Opponent's gonna bounce Nissa. Let's make sure we add more mana first. So we can still replay Nissa here, and then I think we get Shilob in play before playing Expertise or Wild Speaker. Although if our opponent has some sort of uh, Rivers Rebuke, it's gonna hurt next turn. But so be it. And then we can attack our Invasion, probably just with Shieldreds. Alright, River's Rebuke would be the worst case here. Grazer's fine. And Traverse of the Outlands, okay. Putin gets to find 12 lands and put them on the battlefield. So they've got all the mana they need. They can replay Moti as many times as they want. Would love to find one of our fight spells so we get our own Emoti food token. And carry it as... Alright, our opponent's out of action at least. So I guess they can redraw with Midnight Clock next turn after sinking a bunch of mana into it. But now it's time for Rishkar's Expertise. And then how about a free Return of the Wild Speaker to keep drawing and gaining life with Shieldred? And then, of course, that's going to be enough for a concession. Likely to find a fight spell, turn Emoti into a food token, and we had a Terra Sunder as well to answer the Midnight Clock before the opponent could draw, so we had all the angles covered. On to the next one. Okay, we're on the play, and it's time for the Mirror Match. Spider vs. Spider. Our hand's quite good. Got some ramp, some removal that ramps. And then the Henge, if we can follow it up with some more creatures. Thoughtseize, that's a good one. Takes into the north most likely, could also go after Henge. Still have a Harrow, has more ramp here at least. No way to spend the extra mana from the untapped lanes, so I'll just pass. Opponent cycles a troll. So in the mirror match, it's going to be tricky to keep Shilob in play, because even with a ward, our opponent's somewhat likely to be able to answer it. And 
and then could play Acolytes, get back a land at the very least. Could draw with Castle, but it's gonna cost us a lot of life. Let's go for Acolytes. Might have wanted to keep green untapped in case we found a Mana Elf. So next turn we could play Shilob, but uh, we might want to take a different approach. Cultivator, another mana creature, we can potentially gain Death Touch and assemble the team. One of the alchemy tutor effects. A Master's Rebuke. Okay, I don't actually mind casting a Death Sprout here on the Cultivator, since that'll help us ramp and potentially set up Shelob plus Rebuke in the same turn. I'm hiding my castle from opposing land destruction in case your opponent's playing with uh, casualties of war, for instance. Opponent plays their own Shelob. Of course, we can't pay the ward cost in addition to playing Rebuke. But uh, I could now play Shelob and play Henge. So make sure we keep green untapped. And then with Henge out, it's going to be easier to replay Shilob, and we can still rebuke if necessary. Bone's going to tear asunder. So now it's less likely that they can also deal with Shilob and pay the ward. So our opponent passes. And yeah, time for rebuke, I think. Shield down. And then we'll definitely keep our own shield instead of the token. Attack for 10, and then Castle can draw. Could draw now in case we find another one drop we can play. Ooh, nice uh, return of the Wild Speaker to draw 8 next turn. Vivian's not gonna stop that. And Vraska can now just clear a path to win the game. Not as fun as drawing eight, admittedly, but sure. I guess we could technically do both. Since we get to make a treasure and then still have five mana for return. All right, so we got to see our shield up a brawl deck in action. And while you can approach it in a few different ways, like Spider Tribal, for instance, I think just playing generally good cards is still the best approach to it. And then if you get to keep shield up on the battlefield, maybe combine it with a fight effect. That's still a great way to leverage shield up's abilities without needing to play some underpowered spiders to synergize with it. And then combining shield up with those powerful card draw effects like Last March of the Ends or a Rishkar's expertise is still incredibly satisfying. So there's other ways you can build around the commander outside of just spider tribal. But yeah, that's going to do it for today's gameplay. I want to thank you for watching, hope you enjoyed, and as always, have a nice day. I also want to thank all my patrons for being part of the channel, and you can become a patron yourself today and decide the topic of future videos over at patreon.com forward slash legendvd.